The disciplinary process is ongoing and uh, um, that process will involve uh, dialogue with unions. Tonight, a report finds racial bias during a Winnipeg 911 call. Right now, less than 2,000 active First Nations on reserve cases have been reported for the first time since early December. And Indigenous services with an update on COVID-19 vaccines. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. We begin in Winnipeg, where the fire paramedic service is at the forefront of a damning new report, first obtained by the Winnipeg Free Press. The report says racism was a factor in two firefighters' refusals to treat an Indigenous patient. With more, here's Daryl Stranger. A 911 call was placed on October 7, 2020 for a 23-year-old Indigenous woman with a self-inflicted stab wound to the neck. Firefighters and paramedics arrived on scene. One paramedic proceeded to treat the woman. According to the report, two firefighters refused to help the paramedic. One firefighter referred to the call as, quote, just another call in the North End. The paramedic filed a complaint under the Respectful Workplace Administrative Standard about the firefighter's conduct. The report, conducted by Laurel Harris of Equitable Solutions Consulting, which APTN obtained a copy of, found, quote, the patient's social standing, race, indigeneity, as the likely subject of implicit bias that affected the conduct of some members that night. The paramedic describes the conduct of one of the firefighters as causing delay in transporting the patient to hospital, compromising the patient's safety. Manitoba Métis President David Chartrand and Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs Grand Chief Arlen Dumas both believe the firefighters involved should be fired, now, as well as Manitoba Liberal Leader Dougal Lamont, who in a statement says, changing culture should mean if a first responder thinks they get to pick and choose who to help, they have no business working as a first responder. Now, despite the calls for the firefighters' dismissal, Winnipeg Fire Paramedic Service Chief John Lane cannot say whether or not those involved will be terminated. The disciplinary process is ongoing and uh, um, that process will involve uh, dialogue with unions. Um, the uh, actual outcomes for individuals uh, are considered to be uh, private human resource uh, matters and uh, will not be discussed publicly. Winnipeg Mayor Brian Bowman acknowledged that the city has a problem with racism. Uh, systemic racism we know exists um, within all levels of government and within every department of those governments. As for how the city is addressing these issues, Bowman said the city has numerous initiatives in place such as the creation and support of the Indigenous Accord and mandatory reconciliation training for all city staff. Lane says frontline workers will be required to complete anti-racism and diversity training. More than 200 WFPS frontline leaders will be required to participate in anti-racism and diversity training. This is being organized right now uh, and will be scheduled within the next month. Additional anti-oppression training is planned for all other employees. And the WFPS has hired two consulting firms to assist with a workplace cultural assessment aimed at getting honest feedback from employees about their experience working at WFPS. The investigator reached out to the patient for the report, but the city has not yet reached out to her in regards to this incident. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. And you can find more details on this story involving the Winnipeg Fire Paramedic Service by going to our website, aptnnews.ca. An Inu community in Quebec is awaiting the results of an independent investigation after two men were targeted in a stop and search by provincial police officers patrolling the area. Lindsay Richardson explains. The Inu Council of Pessimit says racial profiling is what drove provincial police officers to detain two community members on ancestral territory during an intervention over the weekend. Council says it happened on Saturday afternoon. Two Inu men in their 50s were driving on the territory Inu referred to as Nithasanan when they were intercepted by SQ officers. 
en avant, puis l'autre en arrière, puis l'intervention, le contact verbal a été établi par la voix du haut-parleur, c'est comme dans les films. The men were then forced from their car in a scene Saint-Ange, himself a former police officer, describes as Hollywood-like. Des armes de service qui ont été pointées sur les individus, euh, les, les inno qui ont été interpellés, qui ont été arrêtés, qui ont été menottés, mis à genoux euh, au sol, euh, détenus à bord de l'autopatrouille. According to Saint-Ange, the men were released without charges after a full vehicle search. It's believed they were caught in the crosshairs of an auto theft investigation, a detail the SQ would not confirm. Saint-Ange says talks between the community and police are ongoing, but the men in question are traumatized. Uh, on a pris le dossier en main, en charge, pour éviter justement que des membres de notre Première Nation ou l'ensemble des Premières Nations du Québec n'aient à subir de... Uh, d'événements aussi, euh, aussi dramatiques. The case is now on the desk of the BEI, the independent bureau that investigates every time a civilian is injured or killed during a police intervention. Indigenous Affairs Minister Yann Lafreniere says he's following the case closely along with the province's public security minister. The BEI's report is expected in the coming weeks. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. And we'd like to hear what you think about this or any other story you see here. Here's how you can continue the conversation. You can send us an email to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Three Indigenous men have died in Prince George RCMP custody in just three years. Their families want answers, but as reporter Lee Wilson finds out, they are few and far between. Here's a preview of tomorrow night's APTN Investigates Death in Custody. Lily Speed Namox and her mother Tracy Speed stand where Dale Culver died while being taken in police custody in 2017. A bystander filmed the RCMP arrest in Prince George, British Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> I hope for justice. I hope for justice not only just for my dad but for all the other people that have died in police custody. We will follow the family of Dale Culver and their quest for answers. Did race play a factor in his death? So we don't actually know the cause of death. And Culver isn't the only Indigenous man to die in custody in Prince George. Well, I think the systemic racism in, in the police force is, is nothing new uh, to First Nations. So it, racism in the police, discrimination in policing is not just the structures. It's not just individual bad apples. It's individual people. It is the culture that doesn't hold those people accountable. And you can catch the entire episode tomorrow night on APTN Investigates right here after the APTN National News. Well, time to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, shortage? What shortage? The feds claim they're on target with COVID-19 vaccination for Indigenous communities. We're still on track to meet our end of March objective of having administered both doses of the vaccine to 75% of people in regions that are considered at higher risk.
Welcome back. While vaccines are rolling out pretty smoothly in indigenous communities across the country, federal officials say they expect to run into some delivery delays. But as J.B. Pashagumska reports, the government is holding fast to their vaccination projections. Already dealing with reductions of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine deliveries to Canada, Major General Danny Forte announced more reductions of Moderna for the week of February 22. We are originally expected a slightly higher number, around 249,000. Um, and that, no, that number is uh, the quantities that we expect to receive uh, remain to be confirmed by uh, the manufacturer. So at this time, I, I can't really tell you what the quantity will be. But Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller maintains the reductions will not impact vaccinating Indigenous communities and confirmed 180,000 doses were delivered this week. We're still on track to meet our end of March objective of having administered both doses of the vaccine to 75% of people in regions that are considered at higher risk. Indigenous Services Chief Medical Officer Tom Wong says cases in First Nations have greatly reduced since spiking over Christmas. We are beginning to see the results with reduction of active cases by over 50% since last week. Right now, less than 2,000 active First Nations on reserve cases have been reported for the first time since early December. However, with some communities getting ready to administer second doses of the vaccine next week, there are concerns about some vaccine hesitancy from Indigenous communities. But Canada is hoping Indigenous leadership will spearhead ongoing vaccination efforts. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa. Certainly good news there. Still in Ottawa, Canada is now the first country in the world to declare the Proud Boys a terrorist organization. There's been a, a serious and concerning escalation of, of violent, not just rhetoric, but activity and planning. The Proud Boys were one of 13 extremist groups added to the Criminal Code of Canada list of terrorist entities. The list also includes three neo-Nazi organizations and eight affiliates of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. In the U.S., officials are reviewing what role the Proud Boys played in orchestrating the deadly Capitol Hill riot last month. It's a symbolic gesture from the Nova Scotia government, but one that carries a lot of weight for those pushing for equality. I just came up with the idea of a symbolic repayment when I was in the eighth grade while researching Desmond for an English assignment. Nearly 75 years after she refused to leave the whites-only section of a Nova Scotia movie theater, the province has repaid Viola Desmond's $26 fine and court costs. The idea coming from a student in Vaughan, Ontario. The province readjusted the total amount to $1,000, which will be used for a one-time scholarship to Cape Breton University. It's budget day in the Northwest Territories. And Charlotte Mort Jacobs joins us from Yellowknife to break down what's in the budget. Charlotte, thanks for being with us. Uh, what kind of shape is the Northwest Territories in from your understanding of the 2021 budget? Thanks, Dennis. Um, well, I think the 2021 budget really outlines the amount of debt that the NWT is in with the federal government. Um, it was no secret that uh, the GNWT relies heavily from uh, federal transfers, from borrowing money, but we are on track right now uh, to reach our cap of $1.8 billion by 2023-2024, unless immediate action is taken to curb that debt. Uh, now, the federal, I guess the territorial, rather, um, Finance Minister Carolyn Wozniak told media today that she's cautiously optimistic and she's calling this budget a stability budget. Um, we see that the operating surplus is going to be around $69 million, but the, uh, the territory says that it's, I guess, needed to be able to continue with capital projects. Um, things like building roads, building infrastructure, and um, creation of new jobs in government that hopefully will inject some, some more revenue into the territory so we aren't as reliant on the feds. I think the pandemic's eating into everyone's budget. So what sort of spending in the 2021 budget do you think could benefit the Indigenous population and communities in the NWT? 
Yes, well, um, a great deal of our budget goes to health and social services, and uh, something Indigenous governments have been asking for for quite some time is really um, more support for mental health. And there's going to be uh, roughly four and a half million dollars invested in uh, childcare and youth age. Uh, counseling services, so we'll see a new team of about 27 um, staff going to remote communities and uh, spending time in schools, in communities, uh, so that was really great news to hear. Uh, there's also going to be some investment in long-term care homes for uh, elders aging in place, which has been um, a well-talked about topic um, for politicians and community community governments, um, as well as uh, distance learning. Obviously with COVID, uh, there's more and more uh, people that are looking to stay in the North for their education, um, but more support for fiber optics is going to be needed there. Um, and then increase uh, in childcare spaces for daycare will be another one that I think uh, could really help out some, some people in the North. Charlotte, any other budget items you're gonna be keeping an eye on? Yes, um, of course there's, there's so much when it comes to the budget, but I'm very, very interested to see um, how the $123,000 that uh, the territory has announced will go towards um, the North Slave Correctional um, Institute in Yellowknife, the Yellowknife Jail, um, how that money is going to go to programs and services. Uh, you know, it was said that um, there's increased costs, however, um, we're not kind of unsure on what programs and services that will be. There's also going to be um, just under $100,000 going to the uh, Office of the Children's Lawyer. Um, and uh, that will be interesting to see how that money is spent. And of course, with diversification of jobs now that our borders have been closed uh, almost a year now, it will be interesting to see what sort of, uh, what sort of funding there is for, for that. Always interesting. I'm a big fan of budget days, so I uh, appreciate uh, you keeping us up to date on this one, Charlotte. Thank you. Time now for one more quick break. Still to come, an artist and archaeologist are shocked when something strange was found washed up on a beach in British Columbia. 140 years ago, where, where Lekongan people in this area, the elders, talked about the stones down near Finlayson Point, which is where this thing was found. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This gorgeous scenery was taken by Margalang from her camp near Wendaki. Beautiful spot. Be sure to send your pictures to share at aptn.ca. Keep those pictures coming and your photo could be our next photo of the day. Well, let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, plus four with snow for Halifax, one above and flurries in Charlottetown. Minus two with snow in Nain, 12 below for Kujuac. Minus one in Montreal, Saguenay and Quebec City, Plus two and sunny for Toronto, plus one with flurries for Sault Ste. Marie. Plus two in Thunder Bay with flurries, minus three and snow for Sioux Lookout. Minus 25 with snow for Churchill, 17 below and snow in Norway House. Minus three in Winnipeg and Gimli with snow, 18 below for Brandon and Dauphin. Minus 15 in Regina, partly cloudy and 18 below for Saskatoon. Minus 24 in Meadow Lake, 26 below in Buffalo Narrows. Over in northern Alberta, minus 28 in Fort Chip with sunny skies, 24 below for Peace River with snow. Snow and minus 12 in Medicine Hat, 18 below for Edmonton. Sunny and 9 in Vancouver and Victoria. Minus 4 with flurries for Prince George, minus 21 with snow for Fort Nelson. Another cold day for Old Crow, 38 below, minus 18 in Whitehorse, minus 34 for Yellowknife and Wrigley, 33 below in Saks Harbor, minus 40 for Fort McPherson, minus 31 in Baker Lake and Whale Cove, 38 below in Cambridge Bay, minus 39 with snow in Joe Haven, 27 below in Igloo Lake.
The Royal BC Museum is taking a second look at what it announced was an indigenous artifact discovered last summer on a Victoria beach. That's because a local carver has come forward after he saw the piece and realized to his shock it's hardly historic, but his own handiwork. CTV's Sarah Reed has that story. Most people who visit the beach are searching for the perfect rock to skip. But for Ray Bordeaux, he's always keeping an eye out for the perfect rock to carve. And it was so easy to carve it, like that rock is like butter. He found that butter rock here on the beach below Dallas Road in 2017. And it was so perfect, he spent 15 hours on it. It was going to be like a totem pole in so many ways, and I was going to have it just present a lot of faces on there. But Ray never got the chance to finish his masterpiece because the huge slab of sandstone suddenly went missing, and he thought somebody stole it. It was a big loss to me anyway. Fast forward four years, the Royal BC Museum announced the discovery of an Indigenous artifact that washed up on the beach last summer. 140 years ago, where, where Lekongan people in this area, the elders, talked about the stones down near Finlayson Point, which is where this thing was found. The first thing we always make sure we do, uh, which, which our archaeologist Grant Keddy did, was to contact the Songhees First Nation. Who looked at the artifact and also agreed it resembled pillars used in ancient rituals. They were very significant ceremonial pieces. When it was first found, the stone was covered in algae, and now that it's been cleaned off, Ray says it's clear the carving is his. I thought, oh my God, that's the rock that I didn't quite finish carving, and people are making a big deal about it. In an interview with CTV News Today, Chief Ron Sam says he's shocked. The museum says it is now launching a review and will be showing photos to Indigenous elders, as well as meeting with Ron, who's just happy to finally know what happened to his art. Sarah Reed, CTV News, Victoria. Looking forward to the outcome of that review. Well, it's Thursday, so that means another episode of Nation to Nation is just minutes away. Here's host Todd Lamarand with who he has on the show. Two weeks ago, Julie Payette stepped down as Canada's Governor General. Since that time, speculation has run rampant that it's time for an Indigenous person to fill that role. Despite the office being such a symbol of colonialism, former MMIWG Commissioner Michelle Odette says it's an opportunity we can't pass up. That position will be able to educate, to promote and remind what Canada did and still do today whenever uh, that person will travel or meet people on behalf of Canada. Chief Bobby Cameron of the FSIN agrees, but says it should be a First Nations person. I ask him why. And I speak to Amy Norman. She's running for the NDP in the upcoming provincial election in Newfoundland and Labrador. That's all coming up in just a matter of minutes. I'll see you then. Looks like an interesting discussion, and it's just moments away. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Stick around. Todd is next with Nation to Nation. We'll see you back here tomorrow.